Today we have Stephen Greer with us from the DisclosureProject.org. Stephen and his group uh, caught my attention back in 2001 when they had the conference of witnesses and whistleblowers speaking out about the UFO ET question and disclosure at the National Press Club in the U.S. Stephen joins us today to talk about his work and the latest media attention that Stephen Hawking received by stating that it might be dangerous for humans to attempt to contact or even talk to ET. We also have the free energy question, the disclosure issue, and many other things on the plate. So let's get to it. Stephen Greer, welcome to Red Ice Radio. Nice to have you with us. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to join you. Excellent. Uh, let's begin then, Stephen, to talk about uh, another Stephen, Stephen Hawking in this case, and his uh, statement basically about not making contact with E.T., uh, and the possibility that they might even be dangerous and hostile to humans. Uh, this has went all around the world in the media. Larry King did his part, a uh, segment called Are Aliens a Threat as well. Uh, much can be said about this, obviously. But, uh, Stephen, what is your take uh, on all of this? Well, my take on it is that uh, Stephen Hawking, while perhaps uh, bright in some areas, knows nothing of this subject. First of all, um, he doesn't acknowledge the obvious fact that we're already being visited by very advanced uh, interstellar civilizations. And number two, that if they were hostile, this would have been made quite evident by now since they were uh, involved in uh, doing reconnaissance of our nuclear weapons uh, experiments back in the 40s and 50s. And uh, we have since then gone into space. So uh, clearly, if there was a hostile intent behind these civilizations, this would have been expressed um, in, in an unmistakable way. And I think the third point is that uh, when people say these things, which you see a great deal in Hollywood, for example, there are so many movies like Independence Day and War of the Worlds and what have you, uh, it's really a projection of uh, the human condition. It's sort of an anthropocentric projection of the conflict and the wars and the strife we have on this planet. And then we project it on to our imagination of what these other civilizations are like. Hmm. In reality... If you are capable of traveling through interstellar space, which means you have to be able to travel faster than the speed of light, we can get into this in a moment, you possess such technological prowess that there would be nothing on Earth that they would need. For example, you're able to materialize and dematerialize at different points in space-time and also manifest whatever it is that you would need. Uh, moreover, there are probably millions, if not billions, of planets that are like the Earth that have life on them and minerals and what have you that are uh, the way the Earth was, say, uh, 500 million years ago when there was no human civilization on the planet, and yet there was abundant life. There would be no need to come to a planet such as Earth as Stephen Hawking presents to colonize it or to get our mineral wealth or what have you. Hmm. This is sort of a childish um, projection of our own behavior over the last few thousand years where we have invaded, invaded each other uh, and taken over various lands to get minerals or to get territory. And, and I think it really speaks more to his own worldview and his own uh, perhaps insecurities than it does to any scientific analysis of what the facts would be. Hmm. And I think that uh, in addition to that, it's a rather dangerous thing. You know, there are a couple of Lockheed Martin uh, scientists who have come out with a book in the last few years uh, basically saying the same thing. Uh, and you wonder why would Lockheed Martin have their scientists putting out such scary scenarios? Well, the people who benefit from developing very advanced weapon systems such as SDI and weaponizing space would would benefit a great deal from convincing the public that there is an, a threat out in space. Right. And as we know from some of our disclosure project witnesses, such as Werner von Braun's assistant, uh, Dr. Carol Rosen, uh, one of the things that uh, Werner von Braun warned about on his deathbed was that there was a, a scheme, a plan afoot to present the extraterrestrial issue in a frightening way so that there would be a a sort of a payday for the military industrial financial complex that's you know currently about a trillion dollars a year in spending but if you could convince the whole world there's a threat out in space you could build that trillion dollar a year military uh, complex into something maybe that's two or three or four trillion dollars so mm -hmm. I, I think that there are other motivations afoot now whether Stephen Hawking is part of such a motivation is an open question I can't say he is or isn't yeah. but 
his, his line of thinking conforms to the type of manipulation of the mass psychology that you see with scientists from Lockheed Martin and other big defense contractors who, who would, would profit enormously uh, from uh, eventually announcing that there is uh, life out there, but that it's a threat and we should marshal our forces to fight them, uh, <laughs> even though there's not a scintilla of evidence that they are hostile. I mean, exactly. This is very interesting because uh, people have argued that uh, a staged fake alien invasion might even be uh, in the planning here, so to speak. And, and reasons for this might be, just as you say, weaponization of space and things like that. I guess if we go back to Werner von Braun again and, and some of the things that uh, Carolyn Roslin brought out, his assistant, um, uh, do you think he should be trusted as well, considering his background, uh, where he come from, well, so to speak? I think that, yes, on this issue, he would be trusted in the sense that he knew personally of this plan. Now, he's not our only source. You have to remember that I've been involved since 1993 briefing uh, people like the CIA director and uh, the senior Pentagon officials on this matter, uh, as well as heads of state around the world. And, and what I have found is that there is a very classified project that most of our leaders are not aware of that involves... Uh, presenting this issue in a way that's very frightening, and they have enlisted the media and Hollywood to do this. Mm. Uh, I have a document from the 1950s from the CIA, for example, where they talk about engaging Disney studios to make movies on this subject that would uh, go, uh, would run to the favor of their agenda, and they talk about the psychological warfare, I'm quoting, mm. value of the UFO subject. And I think that you have to ask the question, who, who is behind this whole thing? And I think it is sort of like a, uh, you know, a false flag operation. Now, we have a witness in 1997 when I was doing briefings for Congress in Washington. We, we assembled a private gathering, and we had many members of Congress there. And this is out, outlined in my book, Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge, that came out a couple years ago. That's at disclosureproject.org. And... In, at this meeting, we had a man who had been on some of the planning sessions where they were planning to do exactly what you brought up, and that is to hoax an alien attack on the planet, where mm. they had what are called ARVs, alien reproduction vehicles, which are man-made flying saucers um, that are made by Lockheed Martin and Northrop and, and a consortium of other companies, and that they would use them to attack various places on the earth to make it look like it was extraterrestrial so that the world would go into sort of a panic that they could then capitalize on much the way the world you know has now spent about two trillion dollars on uh, the Iraq and Afghanistan wars based on 9-11 right. so I think that I think what people have to understand is that you have people who are very skilled at manipulating mass psychology and for about 40 or 50 years, there has been a plan afoot that I've had personal knowledge of from people who've been on the inside of the planning of these sort of events. And, and it's not just one person like Werner Von Braun. It's a number of people who have told me this. Now, there's a colonel who has recently surfaced who actually was uh, in on some of the early meetings with the, the late Jimmy Carter presidency and the early Reagan presidency where they were presenting the idea of SDI or Star Wars, and that's putting weapons in space. Mm. And he said that one of the things they used as a sort of a, a card to play was the alien threat card, and that this was specifically brought up as a way to manipulate Ronald Reagan into accepting that this was another reason why we should spend vast sums of money to put weapons up in space. So, and this is a man who's a colonel. I mean, he's not some kind of conspiracy theorist who's, you know, out in the New Age community. So I think that you have to understand is that, you know, these sorts of sources that we have within the Disclosure Project, which now number over 550 military and intelligence and corporate uh, whistleblowers or witnesses who've seen these sorts of projects or have been privy to some of this information hmm. is how we've made our assessment. And my assessment is that this is a very real problem. This is why if you read the briefing that I put together for President um, Obama uh, last year, uh, and it's at disclosureproject.org, at least some of it is up there now, um, we very clearly outlined the risk of this kind of a false flag operation tricking the uh, 
president as well as the Pentagon mm-hmm. into this because mm-hmm. most people, what, you know, most people are very naive about. They think there's some vast conspiracy out there that really doesn't exist uh, in the sense that they they, they envision it. Uh, most people think, well, if you're the CIA director or if you're the, the a, a big admiral or general at the Pentagon, you're in on it. Yeah. And this simply isn't the case. I mean, I sat right. with uh, five-star Admiral Lord Hill Norton at his home, and, and he was uh, furious that he, while being head of the Ministry of Defense in the United Kingdom and head of the military committee for NATO, had been shut out completely of this information. Mm. Uh, and, and yet he had come to learn, of course, that, that these things had happened, that there had been an extraterrestrial vehicle that landed in Rendlesham Forest at the vent waters of Royal Air Force Base. And, and I think that I think people are, unfortunately, uh, have this idea that uh, people in those sort of positions would automatically be in on this kind of intelligence. And it's because they don't understand the highly compartmentalized nature of this project to such an extent that, uh, for example, when I briefed uh, uh, Clinton's first CIA director, R. James Woolsey, uh, he was virtually in tears as he explained to me that he and the president had inquired about these issues. They knew things were going on, but they were completely denied any information and mm-hmm. access. Hmm. So do you think we're talking about a small rogue group potentially within the government structure that are pulling the strings down? What do you think? Yes, it is a relative. Well, it's not that small in terms of its influence, okay. but in terms of the number of people who are read into it. I mean, the, the read into means in, in sort of military speak, briefed, and who have control over it. It's a relatively small number of people. But you know, internationally, there's a committee of around two or three hundred people involved, uh, and it's not just U.S. I mean, it is international. But yes. uh, the, the problem is that it's so highly compartmentalized that even within this group, which at one time used to be called Majestic, and even up until the 1990s, I have a, a secret National Reconnaissance Office document that has Magi on it uh, and Magic on it as code project names, uh, that those operations were so compartmentalized that even – Within those operations, there are people who don't know, the left hand doesn't even know that part of the right hand exists. And this is the nature and the danger of extreme secrecy that John Podesta, uh, the, the chief of staff for Clinton, and, and the, the man who put together the Obama administration between November 4th and, and January 20th uh, of last year, he, John Podesta has publicly called for disclosure and ending secrecy and having yeah. more transparency. And, and and uh, this is a man very close to the current president. Uh, and I can tell you that recent meetings I have had in Washington would indicate that there's a tremendous amount of interest in this subject. The problem is, is that the people that we think have power do not. And this is a very dangerous situation for hmm. that reason. And I think this is why people have to say that, you know, the public has to become educated about this and let their leaders know that they would like to have them do something about this problem because uh, it, they, it, they find it difficult to act in a vacuum. Who would you say has the power to, to do something about this, to have influence in terms of this question of disclosure? Uh, we do. I mean, this is why the Disclosure Project was formed. I mean, I'm not trying to be glib, but, you know, when we did the 2001 National Press Club event, which people can see now, the entirety of it at disclosureproject.org, uh, you'll see that eventually that was seen by about a billion people worldwide. We continue to release documents and information. We have a new set of documents that are up there that are some of the documents in the briefing I gave to uh, President Obama last year. And these include uh, un- uh, these are have not been declassified and released officially, but I have sources within the National Reconnaissance Office and the National Security Agency and CIA who have provided me with documents, and they are legitimate documents that actually have the project code names and code numbers on them, and those are up on our website. And people have asked me, how in the hell can you legally release those things? And I explain that our group has explained that this group, as you said, is rogue and illegal, and therefore they can't cite the National Security Act of the United States or of Great Britain or any other country Mm -hmm. to hide behind. Mm -hmm. We can prove... See, one of the things that is a unique situation with the Disclosure Project is that we're one of the few groups that have actually sat with senior members of the Senate or the Minister of Defense or Secretaries of Defense or 
uh, CIA directors and people of this level. And when those people assure you that they know nothing and have no access to these projects, for whom we have first-hand witnesses who are in those projects, you know that those are run, being run illegally because they're outside a constitutionally required oversight and control. Mm -hmm. Therefore, and this is a very important legal argument, therefore, all those projects are running rogue and illegal, and anything we get, whether it's a document, evidence, testimony, we can legally provide to the public. And that's what we did beginning in 2001. And I think that uh, now whether or not any official response to this is forthcoming, uh, there's a lot of speculation. There are people, let's just say there's an old Lao Tzu saying uh, from, the, from the Tao Te Ching, mm -hmm. those who know do not say and those who say do not know. Mm -hmm. um, but I will tell you that I am always hopeful, but I'm cautiously hopeful. Um, my experience having been doing this now for 18 years or so with people like the CIA director and whatnot, is that there is enormous interest in the subject in those circles. What I haven't seen is the moral courage to do anything about it because mm. threats have been made, uh, people have been assassinated, uh, people are threatened. I'm working with a very senior scientist in the gov largest uh, government lab in the United States who knows about a lot of this stuff personally, and he has told me, and is a man of enormous reputation and integrity, that both he and his wife and his children and grandchildren would all be killed if he told some of the things he has shared with me to the public. So the, the kind of things that have been done by this thuggish group are truly frightening. And uh, those things have happened to me, by the way, mm -hmm. these sort of threats. Mm -hmm. But I'm not deterred because I'm just that kind of person. I'm an emergency doctor who's taken care of many, many people who've been killed over a 50 cent beer. I'm certainly not going to be intimidated by these kind of thugs. Mm -hmm. But I think that the problem is most people who are scientists or politicians or lawyers who work in government, you know, if they get visited by someone in a suit from one of these agencies and says, look, and this is what happened to Jimmy Carter, by the way. We knew this from firsthand uh, testimony, that he was visited after he started making inquiries into this. Uh, and he was told President uh, Carter, if you'd like to complete your first term in office, you'll keep your mouth shut mm. about this issue. Right. And that is not a rumor. That absolutely, that absolutely did happen to a president of the United States. So the question becomes, who has the moral courage to come together. Now, I will say that in Europe, uh, where many of your listeners are located, there are some governments that I don't want to go into which ones they are that have reached out to us, their ministries of defense and their leadership mm -hmm. uh, about this, both for in terms of making contact with these extraterrestrial civilizations and also facilitating disclosure. And there's an enormous base of growing support for ending the secrecy. What they're concerned about is moving unilaterally without the U.S. president and government in, in, in support of that. And that's why I've been doing a lot of sort of uh, back and forth between some of the European uh, interests and, 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 and Washington mm. and trying to sync up, as it were, these interests. The problem is uh, what I had to explain exactly last year this time when we had a delegation come over from one of the G7 countries uh, from Europe is that they didn't realize that the President of the United States, if he, was, if he made a directed inquiry in the subject, would be lied to mm -hmm. about the, the, the subject. Right. And uh, th when they heard that that's what had happened to Bill Clinton, they were sort of, well, the word was, they were horrified. And, and I said, look, the reason that's the case in America they didn't understand it because they're from a you know a smaller country. And even though they're a G7 country, there's no, frankly, no country like America in terms of its military and economic size. And I said, look, you have in America, we lose more money each year in our so-called black budget, the, the secret budget of the United States government, mm. than most other than any other government has. In other words, 
we have 100 to 200 billion US dollars a year disappearing into these black projects and that amount exceeds the total military and intelligence expenditure of any other country in the world and that's right, just right. the part that goes missing yeah. this is just the part that goes even. missing so so, so, so what people have to get their minds around, as, as people are listening from Denmark and France and Germany and what have you, mm. is that the size of this military complex in America is mind-blowing. It is so enormous. Yeah. Um, and in some cases, even trillions have have been lost. We know that as well in terms of what Rumsfeld said back in 2001 as well, before 9-11. But could, if we look at this from the point of view of disclosure again, then, as you mentioned, other countries have been releasing files, the UK, even Sweden, France as well. Um, the question, obviously, is as you explained, or the difficult situation you explained, is how things are going in the U.S. because the nature of the, how things are run. But wh- where do you feel that the um, how could this be resolved? Could this be resolved if ET, so to speak, steps in here and actually do something by, you know, it's it's been said before, uh, kind of as a joke, but land on the White House lawn or what have you? Would that open up this question even more? Well, of course, they have been doing a number of things over the last 50 years. You know, we had up a team of the CSETI. If you go to CSETI.org, we we had up a citizen's diplomatic outreach effort uh, that has been going now for 20 years. And we have had astonishing events um, uh, to the point that we've even had a trans-dimensional ET being appear near our group in the Joshua Tree National Park in November that we got a photograph of that is highly controversial, but there's no question about what it is. Uh, we actually even know what galaxy the, the, this being is from, as, as far-fetched as some people may think that to be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the question is, and, and this is, this is <laughs> they're not going to force the issue before we appear ready. And, and because if they did, they would hit a tripwire where the, 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 the fear mongers, like Stephen Hawking, getting back to that comment, mm-hmm. would say, see, we're being invaded. They, they have to be very careful not to appear as if they're doing anything too aggressive because they know human nature being what it is that the people who would want to m- kind of make hay as it were mm. uh, and spin that event they could spin it in a way that would say oh my god look what's happened we're being invaded by a civilization from another star system mm. and throw the whole world into sort of a, a, a military response like the day the, the, the earth stood still if you look at that old movie from 1951 right. and I think that this is one of the real problems we're facing is that on the one hand the ETs I believe really do want to have open contact occur but in our group, the CSETI.org group, CSETI.org, has been doing this as sort of an ad hoc diplomatic effort um, for a number of years. But in terms of an official response from a, a peaceful diplomatic initiative from our State Department or from the United Nations, this has not been happening. And this is something that needs to happen uh, in an open and transparent way. And I think that uh, they're waiting for us to get to the point that we do that. If they were just to come in and land, uh, at, oh, first of all, if they tried to land on the White House lawn, they'd be blown out of the sky. Mm-hmm. But secondly, and, and this brings up another issue which most people are not aware of, there are very advanced technologies that are called uh, longitudinal or scalar electromagnetic weapons. That right. big spiral that you saw over Norway uh, last fall when Obama was there getting the Nobel Peace Prize that was actually uh, a demonstration of a scalar weapon. Really? And really? Yes, we know how, what that is. How, how do you I know was, that? I was, I, well, I was warned by some people in the military and intelligence community that something like that was going to happen a week before it did. So we were expecting it. Do you know why? Was it a signaler in some way? or would you, why would they It was a, de- it was a demonstration of power, covert okay. power. Mm. In other words, it was a shot across the bow saying, see what we can do. Mm. Now... I think that what people have to understand is that since at least the mid-1960s, there have been operational weapons that uh, can reach into space that have targeted extraterrestrial vehicles. Uh, And in terms of land-based systems, these have been operational since at least the 40s. A lot of people, I don't know if you've heard of the so-called Roswell incident. Sure, of course. Most people have. Um, it's not a myth. It did happen. But what people don't know about that, and I have an FBI document from a, a field agent to J. Edgar Hoover, dated 1947, that states that what that was was that there was actually what euphemistically was called a new radar system, which was actually one of these scalar Tesla type coiled elect- electromagnetic weapon systems that was in a, a radar dome 
at Roswell, where we had our only nuclear weapon storage area at the time. And that was the only nuclear base in the world at the time in 1947, July, when, when that happened. Mm. And when these ET craft moved in, they, they were checking out what in the world we were doing with these nuclear weapons because they knew how dangerous they were. Um, they switched this weapon system on, which because these uh, interstellar spacecraft, when they materialize, are fully electronic. I mean, they're not using jet engines or anything like that. They hit each other, one crashed into the other. So one went down north of Roswell, and the other one continued westward and, and went and crashed near Socorro, New Mexico. And that was actually an early hit by an electromagnetic weapon system hitting an extraterrestrial vehicle. They didn't, you know, I, you know, one of the things that doesn't add up to most scientists is that you don't travel through interstellar distances, fly over New Mexico, and, and just happen to accidentally crash. Right. There was nothing accidental about the Roswell event. It was a deliberate early Star Wars hit. And right. that's now 60-some years ago, 63 years. So what you have to understand is that there is a undeclared, at least to the public, weaponry that exists that have already weaponized space, that's highly classified, that target these craft. So one of the things that we have observed, I'll, I'll give you one example. We had a uh, craft that was right near Mount Shasta, California, where we were doing a training for about 30 people uh, back uh, in 2004 or five, And as this craft emerged from this volcano, and it was this luminous, white, plasma-like uh, energy form, and as it moved towards us and it was signaling to us, we went up on a, a hillside. A high-flying aircraft, the 747, moved in and fired one of these weapons that crashed into the woods right in front of us, about 200 yards in front of our group. Mm -hmm. And it actually burrowed into the ground. Now, it wasn't a solid. It was an energy weapon, an electromagnetic weapon. And we have 40, 30 or 40 witnesses to this, by the way. Now, the ET craft that was there instantly dematerialized. And we had, actually had some very good video footage of these craft around Mount Shasta. What was worrisome to me is that they would take such an action so uh, to, to fire this electromagnetic beam. And this was not thunder or lightning. It was crystal clear sky, and it was clearly, you know, we could see what it was. Hmm. So one of the things that I've told people, and by the way, we're going to do one of these trainings for people in France uh, in uh, this summer. We're actually going to do a three-day, uh, three nights at this, fabulous 2,000-acre place in France on July 10th, 11th, and 12th for people who want to join us. Mm -hmm. They can find out about that at csetti.org. But what, we're, what we've found from the, doing these sort of expeditions all over the world over the last 20 years is that there are countermeasures that have been used. And if they've used those while we're making contact, imagine if an extraterrestrial vehicle tried to land on the White House lawn. So th there has to be a coordinated standing down of these weapon systems at the same time that there's a diplomatic outreach to these civilizations. And to do that, the president and the other leaders around the world need what, what is called actionable intelligence. And that's what we have provided. What I, what I didn't have for Clinton, we now have for Obama. And that is the specific project code names which corporations, which sub-facilities, uh, which project code numbers are involved with this. And we have those. And those mm -hmm. have been provided through very, very high contacts we have in the White House and in the Senate Intelligence Committee and House Intelligence Committee. And, and also it's been provided to the new CI director, Leon Panetta, and, and, and Secretary of Defense, Robert mm -hmm. Gates. Now, whether or not they're actually able to get control of these projects remains to be seen, right. but they're going to have to try. And to do that, they're going to have to come together and show a great deal of courage. And, and you think that they, they approach you guys because they're passionate about this question? They, they, do you think they realize what this would mean? And I, uh, that would obviously get us into that question overall, why this group here on Earth then don't want to have disclosure? W what would the consequence of disclosure mean in terms of uh, geopolitics, energy, etc.? <laughs> Well, it's a little bit like the R.E.N. song. Uh, it's the end of the world as we know it, but I feel fine. Uh, in other words, if you, if you allow this information out, it isn't just the fact that there's intelligent life out there. More than half of the population 
of industrialized countries believe that there's intelligent life out there. Even the Vatican has said as much uh, last year in their statements in the last couple of years. And, and I've had meetings since 1999 and, and, and 2000 with very senior uh, Vatican officials, including people who, are, who work very closely with both the current pope and the previous pope. But what I have found is that the people who are... Uh, uh, really most concerned about this fall into two camps. The, the people who want to keep a lid on the science and technology and the people who want to keep a lid with the current order of religious orthodoxy. And yeah. let me explain this because this is not obvious to people. Mm. Um, when you see one of these so-called UFOs, even the ones that are man-made that most people might confuse with an extraterrestrial one, they're not using Exxon fuel. Or, or a rocket. So they're using a whole new type of physics where they're pulling energy out of the fabric of space-time. And there is an energy factor, and some will call it zero-point energy, uh, I'm not sure if that's correct, but, or, or the energy within the so-called quantum vacuum of space. And there's an electromagnetic potential that can be tapped. Now, if you set up an electromagnetic system, a uh, high-voltage system, you can actually create a mass cancellation effect where an object can become massless. That's why they look like they levitate or float. Right. And it's, a, it's been incorrectly called anti-gravity. But the only reason it's anti-gravity is because, in point of fact, the mass of the object pre approaches zero. So, when, and I'm not going to get into the science of this. I, you know, I'm not a physicist. I'm a medical doctor, and I don't pretend to be a physicist. But we have physicists on our team who, who do understand this and, and who I've studied with and who have actually built these systems, by the way, mm -hmm. um, and who we are trying to liberate from the... <laughs> from the national security state, but they're not being allowed to, to do anything. Okay, so they can't talk uh, openly yet. Uh, no, oh, no, they'd right. absolutely be killed. But I think that but the, this, the problem I, I see is that you have a consortium of interests. I mean, if you look at, at how Dick Cheney and Halliburton moved the whole oil industry into the White House during the Bush years and just dictated energy policy for the United States uh, in those secret meetings, the, the records of which have never been released. What, what you find is that releasing the information that these UFOs are real, also with it is going to have to come the question that any common sense scientist is going to ask, how in the hell are these things moving like this? And when that question is asked, it will be answered because we have people who can answer it. Mm. And when that gets answered, it means it's the end of oil, the end of coal, the end of gas, the end of nuclear power, the end of world poverty, the end of the petrodollar, the end of the current macroeconomic system, which is tantamount to global economic slavery, in my opinion. And I think that you have two or 300 individuals and corporations that currently ha control more than half of the world's wealth. That is a true statistic. Mm. And, and when you see that, it is all about cartels and macroeconomic control. And if you bring out a technology that would allow you to have a generator at your home or in your car that pulls this free energy out of the fabric of space-time, you are never going to be hooked into the utility grid again. You're never going to have to buy, buy petrol from BP or Shell. You're never going to have to buy from Exxon. So this becomes something that is a huge game changer, to use the term, in the macroeconomic order of the world. And this is what they're trying to prevent. It isn't because they're so afraid that people are going to hurl themselves off the Brooklyn Bridge because there's intelligent life out there. Mm. Um, now, the other part of this does speak to more of a philosophical and theological problem. And uh, you can imagine my, I mean, you know, my, as you know, my uncle, my mom's uh, oldest brother uh, was the senior project engineer that, that built the lunar module right. that, that put Neil Armstrong on the moon and yeah. was, put the first man on the moon. And so I come from an aerospace family, and his company was Grumman. It became Northrop Grumman. Mm -hmm. And what what is interesting is that uh, some of the people at JPL that, that I ended up networking to at Jet Propulsion Labs in, in California – had seen the uh, images of these huge structures on the Mars. And, you know, this is not a myth. They do exist, and they're very ancient. Uh, now, the ones that are ancient have corollaries to some of the ancient structures, like the pyramids and obelisks on Earth. Right. 
and there would be an obvious connection. And, and what I was told by a JPL scientist is that the reason those images aren't being released is because it would collapse the foundations of the orthodox fundamentalist religious belief systems of every organized religion on earth. And to which I said, well, good, it's time for childhood's end, let's grow up. Mm. He says, oh, no, you don't understand the power of those sort of interests. They do not want their creation myths uh, up, upended. They do not want... So there's a, a very powerful... Uh, theological mm. challenge that would come with this information. And, uh, you know, there's a great deal of evidence, for example, that our civilization uh, has had visits and, and humanity has had uh, contact with interstellar civilizations going back thousands and thousands of years. Recently in India, there was a several thousand year old uh, artifact found uh, showing what depicts it appears to be uh, an ET craft and ET beings uh, in a cave in, in India. We mm. know in France there's a very old cave drawing that, that quite clearly is showing that. And so the question becomes, uh, are, you know, this has not only major uh, implications for the macroeconomic and science and technology issues, but for the uh, theological power centers, if, it, if you will. Yeah. And, and, and those sort of things. So these are very powerful interests who are slowly coming around to the need for disclosure because they realize that our planet is being destroyed by the current paradigm. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a very big task to get everyone on the page with that. And there's always going to be a certain number of hardliners of course. who aren't going to want that. Now, what I have found, it's interesting, when I first briefed the CIA director during the Clinton years, I was specifically told that there were uh, about a third of this so-called majestic group, this committee of two or 300 people who, who have been maintaining these uh, classified projects, who, who supported the idea of ending secrecy and bringing these technologies out and bringing this information out. I am told now it's about two-thirds, mm -hmm. that we've made enormous progress, because I've been having meetings with a lot of these people who are on this committee over the years. What... The problem is, is that a third of them are still vicious and, and don't mind eating their own. Let me give you an example. Back mm -hmm. in the 90s, a member of this committee, uh, Bill Colby, uh, CIA Director Colby, um, had, he was very old, and he, he had decided that what we were advocating was the right thing to do for humanity, and it was time. And he, the, his best friend was a colonel. Who, who I don't wish to name, because mm. he's still living uh, and still very supportive of what we're trying to do. And he approached us and said, look, I'd like to set up a meeting between you and my friend. And his friend was the CIA director, former CIA director Bill Colby, who had been on the inside of Majestic. And what he wanted to do was transfer some of these technologies to us, as well as funding, so we could get these energy systems out to the world before it was too late. Well, the week he was going to meet, that, that Bill Colby was going to meet with a member of, of my board of directors. Mm. They found him floating down the Potomac River mm. in, a, in an alleged accidental, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, drowning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't. It was not an accidental drowning. Right. We know he was assassinated. And in fact, the colonel actually came to a friend of mine, uh, Sherry Adamack, who who got cancer and died rather quickly who had helped me many, many uh, years uh, in the early days of this project. And he, can't, he looked at me, and, you know, we both were just disrolled over the death of our friends. And he said, well, we can't look back, and we've both had terrible losses, but we just have to move forward and put one step in front of the other. Hmm. But, you know, he acknowledged that this had gotten Bill Colby killed because uh, they had, you know, they will eat their own. And so the hardliners uh, within this so-called majestic group are rather vicious, and they have at their disposal fearsome technologies, and uh, they, they have been willing to use them. So I think that, you know, it's, it's a dynamic situation. More and more people in these classified projects, I recently had a meeting with a man at the CIA who is currently, he's a scientist, a PhD, who is in charge of, what is rather hilariously called WSFM. It stands for Weird Science and Frickin' Magic. That is what it's called. Mm. Within the classified world, these sort of really amazing electromagnetic sciences. Right. And he's, these people are very supportive of this 
information coming out, and they're working behind the scenes to try to make change happen. But ultimately, you have to look at who, you know, when you look at the, the, the multi hundred trillion dollar commodities markets and oil and gas and commodities tradings and so called derivatives, futures markets on these commodities and the electric utilities and all of that, our entire global economy. And, and the machine that runs industrial societies is based on fossil fuel and the burning of stuff. Even a nuclear power plant, all it's doing is creating heat from splitting the atom to heat up water to turn a turbine like an old steam engine did in the 1800s. A, a boiler. Nothing really, yeah. It's a boiler. <laughs> yeah. That's all it is. It's yeah. just a great big a boiler run by the heat of, of fission. Yeah. So there's nothing advanced about any of it. And, and so these, these advanced concepts in physics, which have been suppressed, and, and of science and technology that have been suppressed for 50 to 100 years. Uh, these are the things that would completely change the world order. And the world order is this increasingly centralized macroeconomic beast, frankly, that's destroying the planet and enslaving the world, but has such enormous power that the President of the United States uh, at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue as Bill Clinton called it, he says, well, the White House is the crown jewel of the federal penitentiary system. And that's what Bill Clinton said about the White House. And so, you know, people have these wrong ideas about power and where it really resides. Um, now, I'm not to say that the president doesn't have any power at all or that the Congress, but to exercise the power they do have, they're going to have to come together with Sarkozy and Merkel and the UN Secretary General and uh, the Pope and a whole bunch of other people and uh, have the moral courage to do the right thing for humanity. And it's the moral courage that's now lacking. Uh, there, there's no lacking in actionable intelligence because we have spent, I left my medical career and have spent now uh, 20 years, but, but full time, 10 years, mm. putting together this positive evidence and proof. And, and I think it, actionable intelligence and provided it to these sort of people. But I'm not the president and I'm not a member of Congress or, or, or parliament or what have you. And the question is, will these people do anything about it? And I think for that, the power rests more with the people than the people realize. The people are going to have to, A, get educated on the subject, and B, demand real change. Right, right. And, and because we ha there is an inter it is an interesting situation right now as well. The, this system that you're describing as well seems to be you know, cracking a bit at the edges. It's kind of choking itself. Oil is going up, uh, albeit that kind of, that's artificially created, I think. But uh, that's sure. a side note. Uh, and the bank system is kind of on the brink of, you know, falling apart in its own way as well. And, and everybody else is waiting for everybody else to come out with their, you know, free energy devices or, or stepping forward uh, publicly talking about, you know, these things. Okay, we have the disclosure project, obviously, but these people, but again, there's a, there's a quite a few people who are not willing to step out with their name, so to speak, and talk about this as well. So the question is, what needs to be happen here? Do, do we need to come into such a bad state, a bad situation on the planet before actually this just uh, flushes through, so to speak? Or, or what, what needs to give here, so to speak? What do you think, Stephen? Well, I, I think people have to, to take matters into their own hands. For example, we have, had, we have trained a couple of thousand people to be what we call ambassadors to the universe and learn to make contact. And actually, even though this gets ridiculed a great deal, even in the UFO subculture, the reason the CIA director approached us and the reason a lot is because they know that we succeeded in deciphering the Rosetta Stone of interstellar communication. It has to do with transdimensional issues, consciousness, non-local mind, remote viewing, all kinds of advanced concepts. Uh, and and the, the reason the former head of Army Intelligence came to me and said, basically, what in the hell do you think you're doing after we started doing this and having significant contact back in the early 90s, is that he knew that this was how something could happen on the grassroots that they can't control. They can't control thousands of people going out and making contact once they understand the concepts. And that's what we're going to be teaching at these uh, these uh, workshops that we're doing in, in the United Kingdom and in, uh, in, in, and in France this summer. Mm. And I haven't been over there in 10 years, so it hasn't been so busy, but we're going to be, it's my only trip to Europe to do a training like this in 10 years, and we're going to be in France 
Uh, and it's it's very interesting. But by the way, the, we have a 2,000 acre estate in Brittany that's being uh, given to us to use, where we can have a private setting, and it's it's, it's going to be a very interesting three nights, I believe. Mm. But I think that people have to understand that they have to take the matters into their own hand while advocating to have their governments change. I don't think it's an either or question. Right. The same thing with the energy issue. We started something called the Orionproject.org, yes. which is a nonprofit to raise awareness and also to raise funds to create a laboratory so that the scientists that we've identified can work on these uh, very advanced energy systems uh, and we can bring them out independent of the government. We have the ability to do it. Recently, we have were given a, a, a CD, uh, an intelligence file uh, from a source I don't want to name that has uh, over 2,000 pages of very important documents on it. Uh, that an intelligence operative had put together for us, uh, that if we could put the scientific team together with some funding, and the funding we need is is not a huge amount, but it's, it's, it's depending on how long of a project, three to five million U.S. dollars. We don't have the money to do it at this point, but we're hoping that someone who understands the physics behind these uh, systems will say, look, this is where the real solution to the energy crisis and the environment is going to come from. It isn't going to be solar panels and windmills. Mm -hmm. so, for example, for my home to be turned into a, a solar house is a 250000 U.S. dollar um, investment uh, uh, change. Yeah. And, and, and that's just simply untenable to most American homeowners. Mm. So in order for – and not to mention your car. I mean, you know, and then people say, well, electric cars. But the electric cars are plugged into a grid, and, and in charge, America, yeah. it's 55% it's coal-fired. Sure. Power plants yeah. in China, it's almost 100% coal fired. So you, you, you're you really going backwards with electric cars if you're plugging them into a grid that's being run by coal. They've done studies, you're better off with a hybrid. So to get out of this situation, we have got to bring out these advanced physics and electromagnetic technologies. And so the RyanProject.org is trying to identify people, and we're just about to finish a very professional uh, grant proposal. Uh, in the next couple of weeks that we'll make available to, to people who think they can help raise these funds for us. But, you know, ultimately, you know, people say, well, why can't you just, you know, have someone do this in their garage? And it's a, a, unfortunately a little more complex than that. Mm. Um, and you're not going to be able to do this uh, very easily. There are rumors that people have had such devices. Yeah, yeah. But so far, we have not found anyone that has anything that's legitimate. Uh, and the ones who have, have all had them either confiscated or they've been intimidated. There are a couple of scientists we know who have built these things on their own in their own labs, but they've been very, frankly, roughed up and threatened. And so they don't want to do this by themselves. They, part of it is that we have got to create a secure place where these scientists can work together, properly supported and protected, um, with the public involved. And that's what we're trying to do with the OrionProject.org. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I think that uh, ultimately that's something people can do. I mean, you know, people say, gee, what can I do? I said, well, you know, we're not talking, you know, one study that was done in, uh, in, in, in San Francisco, the, the city of San Francisco gave someone $5 million to just study the feasibility of getting the energy from the waves going in and out of the Golden Gate. Mm. Now, that was just to do a study, not to build anything. For that amount of money, we could build one of these devices and have a prototype out to the world. So what I say to people is that we've got to find a way to educate the right people who can provide either through a foundation or a government or a wealthy individual or a group of individuals a grant to do this R&D, this, this basic science R&D. Because it's not like we're starting from zero. We're starting with a lot of information. And, and frankly, some of the scientists who want to work with us are people who have worked on these systems and mm -hmm. built them. And, and is, it, are these they systems... They can't do it by themselves. They can't simply cannot do it at home in their garage. It's right, ridiculous. right. And, and these are essentially components or ideas based on uh, crashed uh, UFO saucers and things like that? Is that... Okay. No, not no. no, not at all, because you have to understand the laws of the universe are universal. If you go all the way back to 1920s, you have people like, and if you go to the orionproject.org, you'll see there's a lot of research papers and history there. But if you go back to the 20s, you have people like T. Townsend Brown, along with the B. Phil Brown effect, that were doing high voltage experiments where they were getting uh, so-called anti-gravity effects. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, if you go back to the early uh, 1900s, 1902, you have uh, a Tesla and Stubblefield that had an earth battery that was taking the uh, electromagnetic differential between 
the charge of the Earth uh, inside the Earth's soil and the air to, to pick up an electromagnetic charge and to run a generator. Uh, these sorts of things have been done by people thousands of times over, over the last hundred years. And so it's not as exotic as something that's interstellar. Uh, it, it's, it's even these sorts of electromagnetic systems that are but now, the secrecy around those sort of technologies is identical to the UFO issue because it still opens this can of worms of a way to run the world without the Goldman Sachs and the, and the uh, central banks mm. and the oil companies all running the show. Sure. But I think that it, you know, it's two sides of the same coin. When you talk about free energy and new energy and the UFO secrecy, it's really all part of the same issue, mm. frankly. Mm. Um, although there's an added dimension when you deal with the ET issue because of the theological implications. But I think we, we have to understand that the sciences and technologies are already in existence. Uh, we have done about 12 years of research. Dr. Ted Loader, who's a university professor, who's on, on our board, and a number of other people like Dr. Tom Bearden, who's a physicist and a lieutenant colonel retired from the U.S. Army. We've put together the documents and we put together the science and the, and, and the research so that a team of people adequately in a properly equipped lab brought together, and I mean not hundreds of people, but maybe a dozen scientists and physicists and, and electromagnetic engineers and what have you, uh, would be able to come up with something, I believe, within one to two years that would completely replace the internal combustion engine, oil, gas, coal, and nuclear power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, you would think that with that kind of information, people would be lunging at the opportunity to provide uh, three or four or five million dollars to get a lab up and going to do this. Sure. But that has not happened. And, it, and uh, part of the reason for it is that some of the people who have been interested in that have told us that they're afraid that there'll be reprisals if they do. I think that it would be easier if there were 100,000 people who each gave fifty dollars right. to the Orion Project? Right. You see what I'm saying? Yep, yep. But that requires people taking an interest in networking this because it's yep. much, it's much more likely you can get a hundred thousand people to do fifty dollars a piece uh, as a contribution to open this laboratory than you're going to have one person write a check of that amount because if they're th if they're if they're that wealthy, it's also possible that they might be approached and be. Uh, warned away from doing it. Mm. We just had this happen, by the way. I have to say, one of the tragic tragedies of the last 30 days that, that you don't know about, but I'm going to talk about it here mm. as well, mm. is that we had three scientists who were top secret scientists who had agreed to bring out these technologies with us, who've actually built these things. Okay. I mean, I'm talking about folks who've done work for all the three-letter agencies, if you get my drift. Mm -hmm. And we've been meeting with them for a couple of years. One of them we actually had under contract to start doing some research and development for us. And all three of these scientists were, within a 30-day period, threatened. And one of them was actually visited by a former CIA director and warned off from proceeding okay. and helping us do this. Mm. So the kind of, you know, this sounds like a conspiracy theory. It is not. We have this documented in a file we're not going to go into it publicly at this point, but if anything were to happen to my team, it would hit the Internet, frankly. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's in a, what we call a dead man switch. And if anything happens to me or my team, all these documents hit the Internet, including the name of this former CIA director who's been interfering uh, with, with this effort. But, you know, these kind of scientists are – they're brilliant, but they're not people who are – Leaders, they're, they're, they, they've been cogs in a big machine, mm -hmm. and their pensions are dependent on that machine right. and uh, everything else. And so what the public has to understand is that the orionproject.org, as well as disclosureproject.org, has got to have the support of the public in order to proceed. We've kind of gone as far as we can. You know, I mean, uh, Dr. Jan Bravo, who's on our board of, uh, of the orionproject.org, has, has donated hundreds of thousands of dollars and mm -hmm. has done enormous work. She's recently retired from her medical career. She's also an emergency doctor like I am to work full time with me. But, you know, we've sort of let, reached the limit of what we can do as just little individuals because we're not, you know, rich and powerful people. And, but, but, but what we have found is that if the public were to get involved and network these ideas to the right people, right. I think rather quickly we could get the funding in place to do this. 
And uh, on top of it, people need to understand, you know, there are three big projects we're doing, disclosureproject.org, the Orionproject.org, and csetti.org. And mm-hmm. everyone can learn how to do these techniques to make contact and basically bypass the stranglehold of Majestic in terms of, of contacting these civilizations. Now, what you have to understand is that the way that contact might proceed is pretty strange. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, J. Allen Hynek had coined the term high strangeness. And, and then if you look at the last, we put out a book this October uh, called Contact, Countdown the Transformation. And with it, if you order it on disclosureproject.org, it actually has a DVD of some of the really strange images of craft and things that have appeared right near our contact groups. Mm-hmm. And people are going to be pretty amazed because it isn't quite out of Hollywood. It's more bizarre than that. And, and, and what you're dealing with are civilizations, because they go faster than the speed of light, can be in, superimposed in space-time right over your house or right in, the, in your backyard. You won't see it with the naked eye, but there'll be all kinds of strange electromagnetic effects that'll start happening. Uh, and, and so while we have had these crafts fully materialized, they do it very briefly, I think, because usually... Uh, for example, last time we had a craft fully materialized in England, uh, the hillside above which it appeared was swarming with helicopters and jets within about uh, 10 or 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. So uh, these things are picked up by satellite systems, and it becomes a rather dangerous situation. But there are other ways that they can make contact where they sort of stay beyond the crossing point of light, the veil of light, as it were, mm-hmm. in these trans-dimensional forms. Mm-hmm. And this gets into the whole discussion of, if you're going, if you speed up a spacecraft and everyone in it beyond the speed of light, what is that? What form is that in? Yeah. And this gets into some rather odd stuff. It almost becomes shamanic, but uh, in terms of the discussion, and this is where you have to have a deep understanding of consciousness and what I call the ancient Vedic tradition of uh, cities, the S I D D H I S, the, these uh, strange ways that forms appear in dematerialize and rematerialize because any civilization that goes faster than the speed of light uh, a priori by definition mm-hmm. are not going to be using 21st century earth sort of technologies right, and right. their communication systems have to go faster than the speed of light and so do their transportation systems and so you start dealing with a whole multiverse as it were of trans-dimensional interdimensional reality. And this is what we teach people in these contact events. And it's not that hard to understand. It's something everyone should have known by the 1950s. But again, this information has been suppressed both by religious leaders as well as scientific leaders because they want the people just to be ignorant of these things. And uh, through their ignorance and fear, they can control them. Absolutely. Uh, Stephen, I have a final question that I want to run by you as well before we wrap things up here for this time. And, and again, it actually goes back to this question of, of the aliens and, and, and how we know that they are benevolent. Uh, we, we, if we look at it from a different perspective, uh, we might, uh, some might argue that we're looking at a slow colonization of sort. Uh, if we, talk, for instance, talk about uh, some of the research like people of, from David Jacobs to Bud Hopkins and other abdu- abductees as well. Uh, the question there is, how would you approach that material? Would you say that no, that actually is being run by a human group that are trying to portray the aliens as bad guys and are simulating these uh, horrific abduction experiences. Or what do you think we're looking at there in terms of a, another point of view to this whole question? Well, I don't think it's that simple. I think it's, it's a mixed bag. For example, we know there are people who have had contact with ETs who then subsequently are targeted with uh, military intelligence weapon systems that simulate these so-called abductions. Uh, for example, I know people who have been on abduction squads who are special forces and army ranger people that I know who have uh, committed these horrible abduction acts. And people think that they are ET or alien, and they're not. For example, there's a man named Stan Romanek who, who uh, I visited uh, uh, about two years ago uh, out at his home in, in uh, Denver, mm. in a Denver suburb. And he has a a videotape of this thing that looks like a gray, you know, like you hear about from Whitley Strieber and Bud Hopkins and all those folks. Right. And uh, his father had been an Air Force officer and he had passed away, but apparently had some friends still in, in, in the military looking out for Stan Romanek. And when these events started happening, he started getting phone calls from a computerized, synthesized voice 
which I'm sure is from from friendly people within the Air Force intelligence community that knew his father. Mm-hmm. And and when this event happened that everyone has heard about, um, because I've heard this recording, I've been to this man's home and seen all the footage that the public hasn't seen yet, Mm -hmm. and they said, it's one of the fake ones. Stan is one of the fake ones. Mm. Fake ones. Mm -hmm. And and Stan, and he was working with a lot of MUFON investigators, the Mutual UFO Network. No one knew what that meant. I said, well, of course. I mean, Martin Cannon elucidated this in 1988, 1989. These are what are called PLFs, program life forms that are man-made, that look like grays. They're not ET at all. And his mouth dropped open. I said, you don't know about this? And he says, no, I don't. I said, oh, my God. I said, this is something we've known about for at least 20 years. There's a very well-organized program of, of man-made flying saucers and trans-dimensional technologies, electromagnetic warfare systems, as well as these strange-looking creatures uh, that they uh, have that, that some look like the greys, some look like the reptilians. And these are manufactured. I know some physicists who've actually worked on building these robotic ET creatures. Mm-hmm. And Stan didn't know this. Stan Romanek didn't know this at all. And I said, well, of course, that's what it is. And, 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 that, and the, 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 the recording, the warning that came into him after he had this experience and was abducted, went further to say that the reason that he had blacked out and passed out while he was filming this creature in his kitchen was because they threw a chemical canister. And this is completely exactly what one of the Army Rangers told me, is that they had special chemicals that alter awareness, as well as electromagnetic warfare systems, the so-called psychotronic that mm-hmm. affect awareness. Yeah. As well as, and so, you know, the, 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 the picture gets rather mixed where yeah. people... And, and unfortunately, if you talk about this at a UFO conference, you're blacklisted from it the next year. <laughs> because this is what happened to Martin Cannon and others, is that when they started to talk about this, their computers were hacked into, they were blacklisted from presenting this information at UFO conferences um, and off of radio shows. This is the core of the secret that these, uh, this majestic group doesn't want to have known, and that is that there are a lot of people who have had experiences that they think are ET and are actually man-made hoaxes. Mm -hmm. Now, this isn't to say all people who've had contact have had a hoaxed event. It's both going on, but you have to have the discernment to know that both are going on. And this isn't being talked about. It's being suppressed even within UFO research circles. And and how do you do that under some kind of, uh, you know, substance which uh, takes you into another realm of consciousness as well? That's very tricky, very difficult. It does. It is. And, and that discernment, it's, it's like, you know, is it real or is it Memorex? And, sure. and this gets into, you have to, but if you don't know that it's even possible, you're going to assume that everything like this that happens is of ET origins when it is not. Yeah. Even these implants, by the way, I have a scientist who had worked with some really high-tech companies that had included some materials from meteorites and stuff to make these implants so that they would look like they came from outer space. And, you know, you have people pulling these implants out. See, this is proof. I'm going, well, actually, no. I know the company that's been making these implants, which are very sophisticated electromagnetic devices for tracking people. And uh, it sounds all very implausible and sinister until you consider the fact that the psychological warfare value of presenting the aliens in such a frightening and negative light is enormously profitable in the future to Lockheed Martin and to the war profiteers who make trillions of dollars a year on fear. (laughs) And so, you know, this is highly manipulative and it's very sophisticated. And most people find this to be just implausible that there would be classified projects that would have these capabilities. And, And that's one of the sad things is that people really, you can't even begin to, to investigate what part of what's going on is extraterrestrial until you have a full understanding of what our capabilities are within the classified world. And and I think both have to be looked at very thoroughly before you reach any conclusions. That is a really interesting uh, perspective, and uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's worth putting into the the bigger picture of things here as well. Uh, Some website for you guys out there to check out, DiscloseureProject.org, the OrionProject.org, and CSETI. Dot org The books Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge, and also the new one here, Contact, Countdown to Transformation. Uh, thank you for your time today, Stephen Greer. Keep up the important work. Uh, we'd love to have you back at some point. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure speaking with you.
That's our program with Stephen Greer. Thank you for listening. Follow us at RedEyesCreations.com. Check out our free radio archives, a year of interviews, Red Ice TV, and archives going back to 2006. We'll be back with more before you know it with Barbara Han Klo, archaeologist Klaus Schmidt on Gibleki Tepe in Turkey, William Glyn Jones on star maps, mythology, and ancient art. Richard C. Hoagland, Laird Scranton on the science of the Dogon, Lucy Wyatt, Jim Gardner, Laura Magdalene Eisenhower on the secret colony on Mars, just to mention... Fish, um, ...projection of our own behavior over the last few thousand years where we have invaded, invaded each other uh, and taken over various lands to get minerals or to get territory. And, and I think it really speaks more to his own worldview and his own... Uh, perhaps insecurities than it does to any scientific analysis of what the facts would be. Hmm. And I think that uh, in addition to that, it's a rather dangerous thing. You know, there are a couple of Lockheed Martin uh, scientists who have come out with a book in the last few years uh, basically saying the same thing. Uh, and you wonder why would Lockheed Martin have their scientists putting out such scary scenarios? Well, the people who benefit from developing very advanced weapon systems such as SDI and weaponizing space would would benefit a great deal from convincing the public that there is an, a, a threat out in space. Right. And as we know from some of our disclosure project witnesses such as Werner Von Braun's assistant, uh, Dr. Carol Rosen, uh, one of the things that uh, Werner Von Braun warned about on his deathbed was that there was a, a scheme, a plan afoot to present the extraterrestrial issue in a frightening way so that there would be a, a sort of a payday for the military industrial financial complex that's you know currently about a trillion dollars a year in spending but if you could convince the whole world there's a threat out in space you could build that trillion dollar a year military uh, complex into something Today we have Stephen Greer with us from the DisclosureProject.org. Stephen and his group uh, caught my attention back in 2001 when they had the conference of witnesses and whistleblowers speaking out about the UFO ET question and disclosure at the National Press Club in the US. Stephen joins us today to talk about his work and the latest media attention that Stephen Hawking received by stating that it might be dangerous for humans to attempt to contact or even talk to ET. We also have the free energy question, the disclosure issue, and many other things on the plate. So let's get to it. Stephen Greer, welcome to Red Ice Radio. Nice to have you with us. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to join you. Excellent. Uh, let's begin then, Stephen, to talk about uh, another Stephen, Stephen Hawking in this case, and his uh, statement basically about not making contact with E.T., uh, and the possibility that they might even be dangerous and hostile to humans. Uh, this has went all around the world in the media. Larry King did his part, a uh, segment called Are Aliens a Threat as well. Uh, much can be said about this, obviously. But, uh, Stephen, what is your take uh, on all of this? Well, my take on it is that uh, Stephen Hawking, while perhaps uh, bright in some areas, knows nothing of this subject. First of all, um, he doesn't acknowledge the obvious fact that we're already being visited by very advanced uh, interstellar civilizations. And number two, that if they were hostile, this would have been made quite evident by now since they were uh, involved in uh, doing reconnaissance of our nuclear weapons uh, experiments back in the 40s and 50s, and maybe that's two or three or four trillion dollars. So mm -hmm. I, I think that there are other motivations afoot. Now, whether Stephen Hawking is part of such a motivation is an open question. I can't say he is or isn't. Yeah. But... His, his line of thinking conforms to the type of manipulation of the mass psychology that you see with scientists from Lockheed Martin and other big defense contractors who, who would, would profit enormously uh, from uh, eventually announcing that there is uh, life out there, but that it's a threat and we should marshal our forces to fight them, uh, <laughs> even though there's not a scintilla of evidence that they are hostile. I mean, exactly. This is very interesting because uh, people have argued that uh, a staged fake alien invasion might even be uh, in the planning here, so to speak. And, and reasons for this might be, just as you say, weaponization of space and things like that. I guess if we go back to Werner von Braun again and, and some of the things that uh, Carolyn Roslin brought out, his assistant, and, uh, do you think he should be trusted as well, considering his background, uh, where he come from, well, so to speak? 
I, I think that, yes, on this issue, he would be trusted in the sense that he knew personally of this plan. Now, he's not our only source. You have to remember that I've been involved since 1993 briefing uh, people like the CIA director and uh, the senior Pentagon officials on this matter, uh, as well as heads of state around the world. And, and what I have found is that there is a very classified project that most of our leaders are not aware of. Uh, we have since then gone into space. So uh, clearly, if there was a hostile intent behind these civilizations, this would have been expressed um, in, in an unmistakable way. And I think the third point is that uh, when people say these things, which you see a great deal in Hollywood, for example, there are so many movies like Independence Day and War of the Worlds and what have you, uh, it's really a projection of uh, the human condition. It's sort of an anthropocentric projection of the conflict and the wars and the strife we have on this planet. And then we project it on to our imagination of what these other civilizations are like. <laughs> In reality, if you are capable of traveling through interstellar space, which means you have to be able to travel faster than the speed of light, we can get into this in a moment, you possess such technological prowess that there would be nothing on Earth that they would need. For example, you're able to materialize and dematerialize at different points in space-time and also manifest whatever it is that you would need. Uh, moreover, there are probably millions, if not billions, of planets that are like the Earth that have life on them and minerals and what have you that are uh, the way the Earth was, say, uh, 500 million years ago when there was no human civilization on the planet, and yet there was abundant life. There would be no need to come to a planet such as Earth as Stephen Hawking presents to colonize it or to get our mineral wealth or what have you. Hmm. This is sort of a child that involves uh, presenting this issue in a way that's very frightening, and they have enlisted the media and Hollywood to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a document from the 1950s from the CIA, for example, where they talk about engaging Disney studios to make movies on this subject that would uh, go, uh, would run to the favor of their agenda, and they talk about the psychological warfare, I'm quoting, mm -hmm. value of the UFO subject. And I think that you have to ask the question, who, who is behind this whole thing? And I think it is sort of like a, uh, you know, a false flag operation. Now, we have a witness in 1997 when I was doing briefings for Congress in Washington. We, we assembled a private gathering, and we had many members of Congress there. And this is how outlined in my book, Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge, that came out a couple years ago. That's at disclosureproject.org. And... In, at this meeting, we had a man who had been on some of the planning sessions where they were planning to do exactly what you brought up, and that is to hoax an alien attack on the planet, where mm -hmm. they had what are called ARVs, alien reproduction vehicles, which are man-made flying saucers um, that are made by Lockheed Martin and Northrop and, and a consortium of other companies, and that they would use them to attack various places on the earth to make it look like it was extraterrestrial so that the world would go into sort of a panic that they could then capitalize.